All right. So the guidelines for breeders, I think that is up for the breed club and I'm happy to be involved about what you would do about the score. You know, it's got to be somewhere towards this lower end. So, you know, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, I think would be a good place to decide to breed from. Or, you know, maybe if an animal has a slightly higher score, like in the the 15 to 20 range or something to re-score uh, them uh, later on. But certainly it looks like early scoring would be uh, something of, that can be done. So please discuss diagnostic treatment options that don't require CT scans in veterinary teaching hospitals. Well, I, I don't think if the animal is just coming in purely for an upper airway exam, it's nice to do a CT, but it isn't essential. We did it really to look at the intranasal component and compare it to the brachycephalic nose. Though having said that, I've had some dogs that have acute on chronic presentations that have had uh, little granulomas in their nose from, you know, snorting up uh, a seed or so, far, so forth. So if the, anim- if the dog is clinical, uh, in other words, has got severe respiratory distress, I do recommend a CT. Or, or a retroflex view, but I think mostly you can get away with doing a scope. The average practitioner, you know, I think it's difficult. The average practitioner can be trained to do a competent upper airway examination. Um, I, I think we're all getting better at doing that now, uh, you know, other opposed than just sort of looking down with the with the Miller laryngoscope. And we do have guidelines for that and we have uh, templates for it as well. Uh, it would be nice to do a retroflex view and also to scooch down into the trachea and have a look at that. But I think that is the way it's going to become. It's going to come is that maybe some practitioners can be trained to do the airway exam that we need so that we can do the scoring. So the Norwich Terrier has been evaluated at four years and is in mildest category, so it has a low NTUAS score. I don't know if you need to check again because, you know, I think if he's mild, he's probably going to stay mild. You know, as I mentioned in the longitudinal study and we should probably do more of these dogs that it looks like they can go either way and there's probably a lot of variables that are at play uh, in that area and then the next question is, is about if other breeds have been linked to this issue uh, other than Norwich's and you know I, we did look at these 12 Norfolk Terriers and 11 had no history and yes had one history uh, and only seven of those were actually examined did upper airway exams and Five out of seven had redundant dorsal pharyngeal wall. Only two out of seven had supraglottic mucosa or medially displaced cuneiforms. Five out of seven had effaced laryngeal ventricles and six out of seven had infraglottic keyhole. So there's hints of the Norwich in the Norfolk Terrier. But other than that, I have not seen any other breed with this upper airway condition. I think it is unique and very interesting. As far as breeders scoping and scoring their dogs, well, I think the score should be used in making your breeding decisions, yes. I will let Paige answer about SARS or DAMS. I don't think we know um, if it's X-linked and also whether she thinks it's dominant or recessive. As soon as I finish this, I'll pass it over to her. I have not seen any uh, GI surgeries being more common with Norwich Terriers with upper airway syndrome. I wouldn't be surprised if they are more prone to reflux and regurgitation. It would make sense. And Dr. Johnson might be better at answering that question as well. So I'll let her come on. Well, I think that is an interesting comment. And we have had several Norwiches at UC Davis that have had concurrent enteropathies. We haven't done GI biopsies in most of them, but they have had low B12s, abnormal abdominal ultrasounds, as well as the typical blood work changes that we find with that condition. And most of them have been pretty well controlled on uh, dietary modification. And then, yes, this one about overweight, I think weight loss is huge. You really want to have a lean Norwich Terrier. Very difficult because, you know, sometimes they tend to stack on the pounds. So as lean as possible is really good. You've got to be able to feel those ribs. Managing this condition really has to be environment control. Nasal congestion doesn't seem to play a role, though they do have a lot of phlegm. I wouldn't keep a, a dog on Claritin for a long term. And allergies were just the same, uh, is one thing I didn't mention, were just the same as in the yes history group as in the no history group. Well, I would just reiterate what Dr. Stanley said, is that weight control is critical in these dogs. 
if they can be skinny, they can be very well managed over the course of many years. Okay, so back to Dr. Berger. Thanks, Dr. Stanley. Before we invite the other panelists in, just a question. Can you please just clarify very briefly, are trachea issues a problem with this condition in Norwich Terriers or not? I can clarify that very easily. No. Okay, perfect. And is there any peer-reviewed literature published on this at this time? Well, that would be a good question for Dr. Lay. She's writing the paper now and uh, it will probably be submitted in the next few months. Okay, perfect. So I guess at this point, I'd, I'd like to invite Dr. Winkler to talk just briefly about the genetics, the DNA testing questions. Doctor, can you shed some light on that? As far as the DNA testing planned, if we were to find the true culprit gene, there would be a DNA test made available for that. As far as the Adam TS3, I am not sure what the Schoenbeck group has set up for that, but we don't have any direct plans at the Michigan State University lab to set up testing for breeders. That might be something that we need to discuss further. And then as far as how this disease is inherited, I, we don't know, but it's unlikely to be X-linked since we seem to have equal numbers of males and females affected. So I don't think it's excellent. And that's in regards to the question about um, whether or not it's passed from sires or dams more. So I think what we'll need to be doing is some detailed pedigree analysis with the scoring that we have now uh, to see whether or not we think it's recessive or dominantly inherited. Thanks for that. And, you know, I'm going to ask you another question because we had uh, somebody uh, participating here who was thinking about becoming a Norwich Terrier owner, buying a dog. Is there any guidance that we can be providing to pet owners who might be looking at this breed? Well, I can say something. First of all, these dogs are just simply the most gorgeous dogs in the world. I mean, they are, are just so attentive. They're so affectionate. They're full of spunk. I just love them. They're, they're really good. And if you're going to buy a Norwich Terrier, I would go through the club and ask them for guidance. There's, there's a whole lot about this condition on the NTCA website. And they're fully aware of it. They've, they've embraced the uh, investigation of it. They're not trying to sweep it under the, the rug or anything like that. And we have really, they have really good breeders there. So I would, I would go through the club because they're gorgeous dogs. I agree with everything that Bryden has said. I absolutely adore Norwich Terriers. And what I've been so impressed with is how attentive the breeders have been to understanding this disease process and doing their utmost to make sure that it does not propagate any further than it already has. Dr. Lay, any, uh, anything you'd like to say at this point? No, but I would like to say, um, actually, I've seen a couple Norse Terrier when I, after I moved down to Georgia, and um, there were actually there's some Norse Terrier owners, they are not aware of this, and they're not, you know, part of the on Norwich Terrier Club of America. And then when I provide this, they're like so amazed about how much work that you guys being done. So I just feel like very honored to be part of it. And um, definitely my students, and right now they're most of them, they know about Norwich Terriers. Awesome. Doctor, is there any training around performing this scoring, evaluating and assigning scores? So that's a really good question. I think that is the next step. You know, I think it's been validated adequately with this study, though it would be nice to do a validation on another 100 dogs or so. But, yeah, I think that would be, I mean, we haven't published it yet. So I think that's the next thing is the discussion with the club. I mean, it's not invasive, but you have to anesthetize the dog to examine its upper airway. So, you know, we could do something like an exercise tolerance test first, though some of these dogs can, can trot around okay but then they decompensate suddenly. And you have to do an exercise tolerance test with the owner because they won't run with you sometimes. <laughs> That's what I found. But, but you know, at the moment, I think the upper airway exam is really helpful for guiding breeding practices. Terrific. At this juncture, Dr. Stanley, I want to thank you 
and Dr. Slade, Johnson, Winkler, and everybody else who's not here tonight. I really appreciate all the work you're doing and for having shared these findings with us tonight. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And we've got to spread the word, not only with the breeders, but with all the owners, really. It's with the veterinarians too. So I, I'm, I hope that all you vets out there that are that are listening will spread the word about this uh, Norwich Terrier Upper Airway Syndrome. Absolutely contact any us anytime, any of our 